Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Save California Salmon and Humboldt State University's Advocacy and Water Protection and Native California Summer Speaker Series and Certificate Program. We're really happy to have you here and really excited to present the second part of our series, uh, Indigenous Environmental Justice. My name is Brittany Arona, and I am an enrolled member of the Hupa Valley Tribe in Northern California, as well as a PhD candidate in Native American Studies at UC Davis. Um, I want to thank Save California Salmon, as well as Humboldt State University's Native American Studies program for um, putting on this series. It is free, so if you are willing and able, please consider um, donating funds or volunteering your time to both of these programs. They're excellent and have been providing these services with the help of uh, many people. Um, links to the presentations and background materials will be posted on Save California Salmon's website on our education page. Um, also, please know that more detailed classes on many of the subjects we will address today and beyond throughout the series are available through Humboldt State University's Native American Studies program. And I believe actually the fall 2020 course list has just been released. So go take a look at the great uh, classes that will be offered this year. Um, I would like to begin today uh, by acknowledging that no matter where the speakers or where you are right now, you are on Native and Indigenous land. I am here on the Nis on Nisanan Miwok land in Sacramento, California. Um, and I also want to take a minute to acknowledge that while land acknowledgements are very important, um, we should all be considering how to give Native land back if possible. We would also like to voice our support for the ongoing um, systematic, I'm um, sorry, the ongoing uh, Black liberation struggle and the dismantling of systematic racism and police account and having more accountability for police. Uh, systematic racism and colonialism impacts almost every aspect of people's lives today, including environmental, water, health, and food policies. Um, I'd also like to take a minute to introduce you to the topic of indigenous environmental justice. Environmental justice is basically the um, idea that black indigenous and people of color have a right to a healthy environment and healthy um, landscape. So indigenous environmental justice recognizes the um, very real implications of environmental degradation, destruction, and ecologi ecological fascism, fascism that continues in, on indigenous lands today. Um, and there are many people throughout the world, indigenous communities, nations, um, that are fighting for the health and protection of their homelands. And a lot of that happens here in California. So we will have some great speakers um, who will be introducing the concept of environmental justice in indigenous communities um, around the world and in California. So I'd like to introduce today our speakers, uh, Tia Oros Peters Zuni is the executive director of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous People and Morningstar Galley from the Pitt Rivers Tribe is a tribal organizer from Save California Salmon. Um, I will also be presenting a topic on indigenous art and activism in environmental justice movements. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass over the presentation to Tia. Kashi, okay, and thank you for inviting me to this conversation. First, I wanna recognize the spirits that are here with us, ancient and everlasting and to acknowledge them and thank those ancestors for being with us here today. They're always with us. Even in movements like these on cyber platforms like Zoom, Facebook Live, their ever presence shapes and informs us on an ongoing basis in our thinking, in our doing, and in all of our ways of being as water protectors, as land defenders, and now with the movements that are happening all over the ground and in the days and the times to come before us, I acknowledge and I thank the Weop Nation whose ancestors' imprints, their echoes are present here in the air, the water, the landscape, and from whose territory I share these words with you today. As mentioned in my biography, I serve as the CEO of the Seventh Generation Fund, 
for Indigenous peoples. We're a transnational organization. Our vision and our work serves Indigenous peoples all over the world. Our purpose is re-Indigenization, which is the active and dynamic process of recovering traditional relationships to land, community, culture, and spirit for self-determination, for collective liberation, and to restore balance. As a native identity-based organization that came out of the grassroots and remains focused there, our work centers Indigenous peoples. Our decolonization and liberation, and it spans an array of issues and sectors and arenas and geographies. It's not confined to colonial borders or to colonial thinking. It's indigenous ways of being, indigenous thinking, indigenous liberation. Core to what we do throughout the indigenous world is expressing, manifesting the belief in the inherent strength and capacity of indigenous peoples. We organize around our assets, not our weaknesses, and that we understand our own issues. We know that we have challenges and we know that we understand them ourselves and that we will find create and develop culturally and ecologically harmonious solutions to respond to our issues or to remedy them, to heal from them. Our organization works to mobilize informational, training and technical assistance, financial resources to equip and empower grassroots peoples all over the world. Because we are the first responders to create our own distinct knowledge systems, our locations, our cultures and contexts as we move forward. We were founded in 1977, and this is our 43rd year. I'm going to stop here to share a clip from a video that we did called Water is Life, Indigenous Perspectives on Water. But we did this in um, October 2012. It features frontline community leaders who are engaged in frontline grassroots actions for water. Water carries memories like computer. Cells, which is why when the rains come, say thank you for visiting. Thank you for remembering, meaning water is memory. So you yourself contains not only your memories, but memories of your ancestors going way, way, way back. It'll never be destroyed. And we will always be with the ancestors. Traditional people who try to prevent this. It's a terrible waste of water. And to them, by allowing that to happen, we are telling our ancestors we don't need them anymore. So they don't come anymore, rarely because we're wasting water. We're breaking a basic law, do not waste water. Because actually they're destroying life, they're destroying the mother, mother of all life. And you know, which includes water as well because that's part of the destruction too because they're pumping all that water out. And once you destroy the land and the water, you're destroying life, including your own life. The life of your future, the life of your future, the future of your own children, your grandchildren, and so forth down the line, you know? You can't do that. The common theme that seems to resonate in the village is that Awitlankusa, in other words, the earth is drying up. Awitelin, Tsitta, Kusa, Mother Earth is drying up. Not just to us who is here, but Everybody around the world, you know, we need water. We need water. Water is what keeps 
keeps us going um, because our bodies are made up water and so that's why um, water is not only important but um, should be most likely the most sacred element um, in the world right now you know because without water we can't exist as a people we can't survive um, to quench that thirst that we have I think we're having some technical difficulties. So I think what I would recommend is that we just close out on those images, if the technical person could do that. And we'll just, we'll just kind of go from here. It's the new world, right? We've been talking about water warriors and our lands and cultures and people, sometimes technical things don't always work. Well, it's from that context and I, I know you got a chance to hear it. Um, and, and maybe we'll be able to put in the in the uh, chat the clip. It's a longer video, a few minutes longer, and um, it's shown in that clip um, when we get a chance to see it. That um, it's from that that context that I share with these words with you today for today's session. Because for Indigenous peoples, the attack on our life and on our ways, the aquicide, the violence, and the taking of our waters has taken its form early. This is nothing new. It took its form immediately at colonial invasion. It came with the savagery that assaulted our shores, trespassed our homelands, transgressed our cultures, and violated our peoples from the very first steps onto our territories. And it continues to do so. This is especially apparent and important to recognize and understand that when we come together to talk about uh, critical issues um, that pertain to indigenous peoples, frontline actions, particularly these that protect water and defend land. We need to put it into the context of history and the ongoing colonization of our lands and peoples, of our waters and of our territories. There is an ongoing and mindful commitment of our peoples though, to organize responses to the targeting and devouring of our communities and of our lands, the territories that have been ravaged and torn apart. Indigenous peoples have been engaged in this work for 528 years, and we're still counting. What our peoples are up against is the unrelenting violence of a colonial society that can never satisfy its hunger to devour more or for its thirst to drink every last drop of water on this, our common mother earth. And it's colonial constructed mindset. It's a social mindset that's been colonial, colonially constructed. It came here, it was not from here. It's from the mainstream thinking that's grounded in individualism, capitalism. It's anti-indigeneity that says everything is for sale. Nothing is valuable unless it can be bought or sold, stolen or taken, exploited or violated. And water, they say, is not the source of all life. It's just here for human use and to perpetuate inequity and greed. It's here to be devoured. But what we say is that we have a right and a responsibility to protect water. Some of us call it kiawe, pa'a, mni, nipi, water, life giver. For indigenous peoples, the significance of water is expressed in a rainbow of songs, of stories and ceremonies, holding a potent place in our cultures, linking us together in a continuous life affirming cycle. And yet increasingly we see that our territories are either parched or flooded, they're being destroyed by the unquenchable greed of industrialization, a feature of ongoing settler colonialism. Don't believe we are post-colonial. Don't believe what you're told. Unlearn the messages of mainstream society and of the social media world that tell you we're post-colonial. We are not post-colonial if our lands can still be invaded and if the waters can still be killed with impunity. And not so long a time, the earth was moist, it was fertile, life was abundant, it flourished. Cultures grew, evolved, peoples prospered, species replicated, mass animal migrations, travel to water sources and food sources, hemispheric journeys of butterflies and hummingbirds flew along currents of moist air. Turtles and whales traveled unhindered along jet streams that spiraled around the globe. Our peoples prayed, 
and they still do. And we still sing and we still dance and we still make offerings for peace and for rain. Water has always been respected for having its own destiny. It belongs to itself and it's flowed on its own cutting pathways into canyons, creating fertile meadows, filling oceans. But now this part of the colonial, the colonial journey, we're still confronted. We're confronted with that exploitation, with aquacide, the killing of the waters, killing of the waters by dams and diversions, privatization, extractive industrial and mega agricultural development that tears into our homelands and siphons like a vampire our water. It hydrofracking, toxics and pollution, the weaponizing of water against our people like they did at Standing Rock and so many other places. And the other actions, the external actions that assault us and that inhibit and preclude water's ability to nurture, sustain and generate life. Now, those springs that our ancestors emerged from, from within the womb of Mother Earth, the watersheds that feed our lakes and our cornfields, the water that sustain our bodies, the rivers that carry our prayers, they're contaminated, they're stolen, they're vampire siphoned. Human rights violations, including the ongoing invasions onto indigenous territories, whether it be here in this local area of Northern California, whether it be in the desert regions, whether it be in North Dakota, the unhindered exploitation and wrongful taking of water are actions that threaten the very existence of indigenous peoples, our distinct cultures and our right of religious freedom and the responsibilities we have of relating to sacred places in medicine making, in memory, and in futurity. These actions threaten our spiritual survival. They threaten the survivability of the planet and they violate the rights of human, the rights of mother earth. So I think about the ancestors, yours and mine in the early days before invasion and colonization, before individualism got under and into all of our skins and it's a tenant like that insatiable greed. I think about how the ancestors became and how they established life and order and continuity and how they stayed in right relation with everything in creation. I think of how they dreamed things into being and through their blood memories and now our own blood as a form of water, we manifest those dreams into indigenous realities. They did this through their distinct world views that they traveled, that they passed on to us bonded to water systems, to their homelands, and to the original instructions that they were given. Linked to a continuum of believing and being and of balance, sustainability and forever lasting life, water was at the center. Water is at the center of all things. Because in each word we say, every breath that we take, every tear we shed, we're conceived within, born from, live, breathe, and transcend through water. We are all water beings. Eloqua, thank you. Thank you, Tia. Um, I think you folks could probably tell I was a little nervous when I started, but you so succinctly put all of the things that we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of the series together. And I, I really appreciate that. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I will be presenting next um, on arts, Native American, I'm sorry, nerves are still getting to me, um, on Klamath River activism and art in um, Northern California. So I'm going to share my desktop. Oops. Okay. As Tia said, this is a new world <laughs> that we're all getting used to with the um, Zoom capability. So we appreciate your patience with us as we we're working through those things. Um, so my talk is on env environmental injustice, art and activism on the Klamath River Basin. It is um, my dissertation topic. And I really became interested in the topic because I am from Hoopa Valley. Um, we reside along the Trinity River. And we were heavily impacted by the 2000 
to a fish kill and folks from and within Humboldt County will know and remember that event where upwards of 80,000 uh, mature Chinook salmon uh, died along the riverbanks. And it was a moment that really impacted me. I was a teenager at the time. And it's something that I've thought about for a very long time. Um, and one of the tenets I think of environmental justice tends to focus a lot on policy development and enacting those things through government processes. But um, I was interested in really kind of reflecting on the grassroots advocacy that makes these things possible, like the indigenous people who every day fight for their homelands and um, work towards creating a new world. There you go. Uh, so the Klamath River is home. Uh, tribes, Hupa, Yurok, Shasta, Kruk, Salmon of the Klamath River and its tributaries, uh, Trinity, Trinity, salmon, et cetera. There's a lot of tributaries. I just put the et cetera. Uh, we depend on the basin for cultural and physical revitalization. Our ceremonies take place along the sites, along sites on the river. Um, and fishing is a community event. Families fish with each other. Families have fishing spots. There's coho salmon, steelhead, coastal cutthroat, uh, green and white sturgeon and Pacific lamprey. In the Hupa language, I am a terrible linguist, so I'm not going to attempt to say uh, the Hupa word for the Trinity River, but it roughly translates to a power one should pray to. So it's a very significant force within the Hupa Valley. And um, I grew up going to the rivers with the river with my grandfather and my family up there and swimming and, and enjoying everything that um, the river had to offer us, ha has to offer us. And it really is uh, the lifeblood of the valley and the of folks up in that area. And I'm going to show a map of where that's at for people who are not familiar. So this is just a general picture. Um, if I was giving a longer presentation, I'd start breaking down Edward Curtis and his photographs of people and, and placing us within the past. That photograph was taken in 1910. Um, and sort of the implications that go along with uh, that, like not naming native people who were photographed and not recognizing them as people. Um, but I, I won't do that. If you have questions about it, you are more than welcome to uh, reach out to me. So this is uh, the Klamath River tributary. Um, so you can see it is a very large tributary system and it's choked by multiple dams along its system uh, that creates dangerous environments for the Klamath and um, is right for ecological disaster. And folks who have been taking the certificate program, if you had watched the Klamath River updates, you probably have a little bit more of the history and background on that. Um, mine is just a general overview. And if you don't, I suggest going and watching that because it's a great panel. So plant, uh, problems on the Klamath River, a mass diversion of Klamath water to organ farmers and ranchers via four dams. Uh, there's actually more, but these are the dams that are in focus. J.C. Boyle, Boyle Corp Co. 1 and 2 and Iron Gate create dangerous conditions on the Klamath River and its trinities, in its tributaries. In 2002, the diversion created toxic overheated water that contributed to a fish kill and upwards of 77,000, 80,000 mature Kachinook and coho salmon died on the banks. And this was uh, really the catalyst for a major uh, dam removal effort that was led by many folks, including the Climate Justice Coalition to remove the dams. And it really started as a grassroots um, organization of people coming together along the riverbanks and deciding to do something about it. Um, and that meant traveling to the different owners of the dams and protesting at one point going to Scottish Scotland when it was owned by Scottish Power, when the dams were commissioned by Scottish Power, and then um, then taken over by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and protesting in Nebraska and Portland. So there's a, a grand tradition of that within the Klamath River area. So this is just what the what the dams look like on the Klamath. Um, and if you watch the Klamath River portion again prior to this one, you'll you will have gotten the updates on what's happening. So I won't go into that here. But if you're interested, please go and watch that um, panel. 
but you get kind of a sense of where these dams are and uh, what they look like and where the choke points are for the um, river and the tributaries. So what I really want to talk about today is visual sovereignty. Um, visual sovereignty is a term that is basically focused on the way that indigenous and native people um, enact their sovereignty through different forms of art that can be painting. So on the left is uh, Lynn Risling's art, artwork, photography, um, film, uh, creative means, theater, all of that. And I think that well, there is a very strong visual sovereignty movement on the Klamath River Basin um, with many different artists and people coming together to create um, performance pieces, exhibitions. Um, and, I, and I think it's a little recognized topic outside of the general and local areas, but it's also a very global movement. So the paintings from the Klamath River Basin and the next week we'll also have a more specific talk on this with uh, Julian Lang, uh, Lynn Risling and Katiri Mastin. Um, but there have been many prolific artists that have come out of the Klamath River Basin focusing on environmental, um, environmental justice as well as human rights efforts of, of indigenous people in the area. So here's just to name a few, Julian Lang, Lynn Risling, Brian Tripp, uh, George Blake, Brittany Britton, Rick Barto. And that's like the tip of, of the fantastic artists that have really developed out of our region. So that's uh, Julian's artwork, R Klamath River as their guide. And this was from a museum exhibition I did on um, the Klamath River, trying to get people to think more broadly about activism. So ephemera from the Klamath River activism movement and the no gasket or liens of road. Um, so ephemera is basically the things like uh, posters, um, t-shirts, like the like stuff that you see uh, people enacting at protest movements, which I think are art pieces. They often are. And I there's some incredible people who do um, contribute to that. So this is a shirt from one of the protests in 2014, I believe. Um, we went down to the Bureau of Reclamation um, to have them allow more water flows into the Klamath and Trinity. So stop the, tr stop the killing, release the Trinity flow. And I think something to note about these kinds of grassroots advocacy movements too, is that often it takes like people who care about this, like indigenous people, allies, to go and pressure the government to release water flows, to make sure that the salmon is healthy. And to me, that doesn't seem like a very um, sustainable method to find justice, but people do do that and it's really important, but it would be a lot easier if it was just a given that this would happen or that the dams would be removed and that was a given and that there would be trust that that would happen. Um, so this is a picture of me, <laughs> a picture of me and my friend Vanessa at the BOR, um, Bureau Reclamation protest. I'm wearing this shirt. It's a size, it was like a size large in kids, so it's a little tight on me, but um, it really does take a lot of people power to go down and organize um, and come together through these movements and especially in the movement on the Klamath. So um, Analia Hillman, Yurok tribal member and Klamath Justice Coalition activist, um, no amount of stall stalling will stop the dams from falling. And I think that's a very powerful statement to put out to protect the environment, we will do what we can. So here's uh, some T-shirts from the different movements um, on Dan the Klamath, Bring the Salmon Home. So a lot of these come from like home screen printing things, uh, home screen printing operations. Um, so people go to their home and then screen print and have like their own setup and then hand that out these out. And then often there will, there will also be funded by nonprofits that are interested in contributing as well. So 
think that's an inter an important aspect. And then photography from the Klamath River activism movement. So this is in Portland. And then all of these are from Regina, who is um, also with Save California Salmon. So she contributed to these photographs to the exhibition that I did, which I appreciate. I love that photograph. I think it's great. Um, so I guess to end, I don't know how much, I think I'm about at time, but um, it's a very complex and in-depth conversation to have about visual sovereignty and activism and art and grassroots organizing. And I think the main point that, that I would want you to take away from this is that this is a generational fight. Um, these, this has been happening since before my grandfather's generation, his father, um, his great grandfather, we're fighting these actions against our environment and trying to protect it in the best way we can. And now I'm taking up this mantle and I can't help but think like, what are my kids going to be doing? And like, are they gonna have to take that on too? And it's like, at what point is enough enough? Like the environmental destruction that indigenous people have to face every day um, through removal, through ecofascism, through violence is, to put it lightly, unacceptable. And I think that um, we should really take note of the people who are doing this advocacy at the grassroots level. Um, and it's quite a few. I, I kind of view myself as more of a historian, not a historian, but like, I don't like love the term historian either, but I, I see myself as somebody who can help at least you know, um, think through the arts and advocacy portion of it and help um, record these things for future generations so that we remember. And that, that also happens through family and friends and oral histories and all the things that make us who we are as indigenous and native people. Um, I just wanna thank you for your time and attention and I'm gonna hand it over to Morningstar now. Jimmy Sunwi, Morning Star Gali, Ilakatke, Chi, Ma'ajumawi is Chi. My name is Morning Star Gali, and I am a, this is Ha'ali <laughs> that decided to join in. Um, I'm a tribal water organizer for Save California Salmon. You want to say your name? Mm -mm. No. Okay. And so um, I just wanted to, it's good to be here with all of you again. I just wanted to talk a bit about um, some of the collective organizing efforts that we are doing. Can you hold on one second? Okay. With Save California Salmon. And um, first want to acknowledge that I am here on Nisanan and Miwok territories and that we have been, um, you know, there has been for the last 30 days, um, our, our organizing and our activism has been happening in, in the streets and in keeping people safe. And so I serve um, as a co-lead for the Healing Justice Committee for the Anti-Police Terror Project here in San Sacramento and also am um, ensuring, you know, through that work that folks are receiving the training that they need um, as, as we work collectively. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, through these land acknowledgements and through these efforts to, to name places and to claim, reclaim visibility of indigenous peoples, lands and territories that we also um, must acknowledge are non-federally recognized, are state recognized, are terminated, are disenrolled, are indigenous peoples that are not recognized on their own lands and territories um, as continuous genocide and colonialism has always targeted um, our women, our girls, our two-spirit, trans, and non-binary relatives, and that we have always had a history of activism and environmentalism that has come in many different forms and many different names. And so 
since the times of, of occupation, since the times of invaders landing on our shores, um, since the time here in California of missionization, we have faced incarceration and enslavement of indigenous people's populations. And we are now at a time through the removal of statues, through the removal of monuments to genocide, um, that we are in a moment where that um, needs to be, be acknowledged, needs to be celebrated, and also recognizing that we have much more work ahead of us. So um, thank you for being patient with me as I just wanted to take a moment to speak to that. Let me see if I can share my screen here now. And And so as Brittany had mentioned um, that this is absolutely a generational fight. And so I won't share the video because I know that we are having some technical issues with the, um, with the playback, but this is a clip from 1978 at the federal courthouse in San Francisco. And this is my father, Isidro Bali Jr. And he was speaking to the fishing wars that were taking place and how, um, you know, this is 40 years ago when the US Marshals um, ascended onto tribal peoples that were actively um, fighting for their right to be, to be able to fish um, on their waterways as, as they always have and the violence that they were facing at that time. And so this was the support um, efforts, the community support um, and, and activism that took place to where um, folks, you know, the communities were organizing on the ground and this was people coming together um, to, you know, we, we've had these trade routes um, historically and currently. And so including in that, um, you know, a time that communities were displaced throughout the Bay Area and were able to, to support fishing communities um, by purchasing the fish um, at the time that this was not, not lawful. Um, and so that's part of the continuing work through Save California Salmon. Um, just speaking to my own experience in working for tribal governments and working for my own tribe, there can be um, at times a lot of conserve, you know, it can be very conservative in how tribes feel that they approach the issues um, of our fishing rights and of our water rights and not necessarily wanting to um, feel that there's there's friction being caused with the state. And so now that I, I worked as the tribal historic preservation officer for my tribe for over four years, and now that I'm working outside of, of that tribal government structure, um, there is a way that we are able to advocate um, and work with organizations, work with communities. Um, a lot of these, these fights and efforts um, are not necessarily led through the tribes directly themselves, but on, on the outside from organizers um, and from community members that are able to, to be more, more vocal in speaking out about what is taking place um, and so again, these are photos from, um, from Regina. I want to acknowledge that Regina Chickaloza and um, the fish camps that we have held through Save California Salmon and being able to connect and bring our children, being able to have our families present and talk about this relationship um, with the salmon and 
I had mentioned briefly on, on the last presentation that, you know, personally, I, um, within my own tribe, that the Pacific Gas and Electric that we have been fighting PG&E now um, for many decades. And so, you know, people are seeing that with the fires and what has taken place in, in PG&E not um, being accountable to, to what has occurred, but they have done this to California's indigenous peoples for, for many years now. Um, they never fulfilled their promise to instill fish ladders on our river, on the Pitt River, where six out of the seven dams were placed on our river. And so we have not had salmon within our rivers for over 80 years. And so this is um, my daughter that you just um, saw a few moments ago and, um, and an elder, Jean. And we had gathered in Reading and we had over 200 tribal members um, and community members there in support and um, DWR was, was not happy with, because there's this, um, you know, there's this messaging that, that uh, these state um, entities work well with tribes and that um, they're working well with tribal peoples. And, and so when we show up and we challenge that false narrative um, and we show up, um, as a large force, um, then they have to go back and, you know, and, and answer to that. And so I think I'll just end there. Let's see if I can stop share. And we can, and I can leave, I think that's my time there. So I'll leave it open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Morningstar. Um, that was a great presentation. I always love hearing you speak. Um, so uh, yeah, we can open up the questions now. Um, and Carrie Tully, who is um, helping us coordinate this call can can help with that as well. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to, to post. Well, it looks like we, there's no questions. Oh, here we got some. Um, so this question is from Meg. What is most necessary for non-Indigenous allies to do to help? I, I can take a little part of that. Um, To listen, trust, honor, and believe that um, what Indigenous peoples are saying, what we have been saying for a long time, is true and valid no matter what anybody else is saying. But to stand with and be accountable to the Indigenous peoples that um, you say you're, you're in allyship with. Sometimes, um, non-Indigenous peoples, it's like putting on a shirt and they're like, hey, I'm an ally and I'm gonna go help you guys. But they may not even be in right relation. They may not even know any Indigenous peoples. And the, and the really positive thing about that intention is that there's an intention to be in, engaged and to be supportive and to be helpful. But first you have to do the work and the connection with Indigenous peoples you have to think about the land that you're on, the territories that you're on, and, and do more, kind of like what Brittany was saying earlier than, than a simple acknowledgement to deepen that commitment to the place you are at and to the indigenous peoples where you're hoping to be engaged and to be in right relation, true relation, authentically with, with the peoples and take their guide and their leadership as to what's needed from you. And sometimes it's not always maybe what you thought as you were putting on that shirt that day. 
And um, lastly, I'd say, and it's not just a shirt, it lasts and lasts and goes deeper and deeper and becomes um, who you are and how you contribute to this movement for the rights of Mother Earth and protecting the land, protecting the waters with Indigenous peoples at the lead. I'll just add to that, that this is, you know, this is um, not so much work, but this is a, um, a vision that we are committed to in, in freeing our rivers, in um, being able to work on, on undamming our rivers, um, in healing ourselves through healing the land and healing the waterways, um, having that, that symbiotic relationship with the salmon, um, our relatives. And so this is work that we would be doing um, whether or not we were receiving, you know, any sort of small stipend for it. And so for myself as as a full-time parent, full-time organizer, full-time employee, that this is work that we are very much committed to. Um, and so it's been through, through the efforts of Save California Salmon and the other organizations that, that we work directly with that we've been able um, to better coordinate this. And so being able to um, support those efforts is, is really needed, especially at this time. Yeah, I, I agree with both of your points and I think they're very powerful and true. Um, I think with a lot of organizing efforts and, and people do ask quite a bit, it's like, what can we do? And I think that's a really good question to ask. Um, something, you know, especially in light of the uh, black liberation movements that are happening right now is providing monetary support to these efforts too. It's, um, I think that is really important as allies and in solidarity with each other to, to um, you know, it's it, to help these, help people on the ground who are doing this really hard work. Uh, I, I mean, I know Morningstar, you said it's not work and we would, we would be doing this no matter what, um, which I think is true too, but providing that um, as an ally, I think is helpful. And then, you know, stepping back um, and learning and recognizing that, you know, you don't, if you're a non-Indigenous person and even an Indigenous person in certain spaces, like you may not not, not know everything um, and that's okay, but learn and, and allow Native and Indigenous people to take the lead in the, this um, and provide that, um, background and the backing support of, of money and standing with each other and standing with uh, folks who are fighting for their own liberation. Um, because I can tell you it's extremely difficult and, and trying and, and it's something I think about a lot, like every day, like none of this stuff leaves in my mind. It, it consumes everything that I'm thinking about. Um, and it is difficult that this has been going on for generations and generations. And it's just like, it, it gets emotionally wearing. And I think that's something that's not always just, well, it is discussed quite a bit within our circles, I think. Um, but it's not often recognized by maybe policymakers or um, people in power that this is actually an emotional labor that we're, we're all going through. Um, but that that's what I was thinking as you both were talking and I appreciate that, I appreciate your answers. Um, so we got quite a few questions actually, which is good. Um, let me see. So um, we have another question. It says, you, you all mentioned a few movements here but there are other indigenous led EJ movements are, but are there other indigenous led EJ movements or campaigns that you all feel were particularly effective or would be good campaigns or movements to learn more, to learn from and learn more about? Um, 
I can kick it off a little bit um, in response to that. Um, this is the way I would, would frame that is this is a collective movement and that it's not fractured. There might be some specific things say here where we are in the Klamath River area, or there might be things that are happening out in the Southwest where my people are at. Um, but this, it's, they're not so fractured, even if there are different parties on the ground. In fact, indigenous people's movements are, uh, the movement is pretty well connected. We recognize that issues um, connect, are linked, and sometimes are braided together and may travel for a while together, but that they also have different operating systems on the ground depending upon the cultures, the peoples, the situation, the, the histories of how things unfolded, what happened at, at colonial contact and where things are at today. Um, going back to the question around allyship in particular, really recognizing the indigenous peoples of that place where you're at also informs the movements and where they're taking shape. They're gonna look a little different in different places. I would say they're not so um, different. We know each other. We work together collectively. Um, there's movements, you know, the water movement in particular is completely linked and twined together with protection of sacred sites. But it's also connected to work around basketry. It's connected to work around uh, traditional agriculture and collective farming, the revitalization of our food systems. It's tied to ceremonial action and spirituality. So these are all operate together. And what this part of the conversation is, is with the water, which is the foundational to all indigenous people's movements and is connected to land back all the time. It's always about land and water, it's always about land and water. That um, to pull a thread out for a moment, for a couple of hours of discussion on a topic of water is helpful to illuminate on all of the movements. There's multiple things that are happening simultaneously, often shaped by the cultures and definitely shaped by the landscapes themselves. What's happening in the, the Great Lakes region will be shaped by those lakes and those peoples and their history, just like it is in wherever the actions are happening. I think in, um... I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with everything you, you both are saying so much. Um, and it's really nice to hear because I don't, I mean, I don't, um, I, I just think it's great. Um, you know, I think something that things that are going on in the environmental justice realm, they're not always, I guess, publicized or like there's not media surrounding certain efforts that are going on. Um, like I'm, I'm thinking right now specifically with the Cato tribe and their struggle against the Laytonville um, landfill that's been poisoning their communities, that there hasn't been a lot of, um, I guess, media focus on that. And one of the realities I think of the in indigenous environmental justice movement is that, um, you know, events like Standing Rock, there, which was a huge like media-based effort. Um, I mean, there was like so much written about it. Um, and often reading those things, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, there's a long history of these movements happening and it's happening across the nation and the world, like things that we don't even really know about and like native people talk about quite a bit. So I, I think that to the question of, um, you know, leadership, that there, there is so much leadership happening that's not visibilized. And so I, I often think it's like, how are we making these efforts visible for not just our own communities and ourselves and where we're at, but also for others who are struggling too? Um, and I don't have an answer to that question other than that we talk to each other quite like, you know, we, people who are working in this field talk to each other quite a bit, but then, you know, once the media goes dies down, what happens? You know, what happened at Standing Rock after the media was gone? Like it, nothing changed really. And so it's like, how are we bringing our power back to ourselves? Um, it's something I think about quite a bit in, in discussions around environmental justice. Um, and I don't have answers 
I, I guess these are all just rhetorical questions that I'm hoping that we think about collectively as a group. Um, Morning, sorry, I don't know if you had anything to add to the question. Um, yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a couple of questions here, so I'm not sure how we're going to go through that, but I think just, you know, the majority of them in asking how people um, can support, I think that it's very important to recognize the land that you're on and um, where you live and where you work and recognize that you're a guest there and how it is that you can contribute because there's going to be, there's land struggles, there's water struggles, there's sacred site protection efforts, um, wherever you, you are based across Turtle Island. And so when I lived in, in the Bay Area, I was very active in supporting the efforts around um, protecting the shell mounds and participated in the shell mound peace walks. Um, when I lived back home on, on my own tribal lands, you know, working there and now um, that I'm in the Sacramento area being, being in service to the local tribes and helping to support um, the efforts here. And, and, you know, a big part of that is just, is just around visibility especially with California indigenous peoples is that every day is a fight for visibility and being able to um, recognize and acknowledge the, the history here that has been um, so vastly erased. And so um, being able to, to find that through um, supporting in, in the water issues, in the statue removal efforts, um, in, you know, just the visibility of the local Miwok and Nisanan and Maidu peoples um, that, you know, everyone has, has a role that they can contribute and support in that way. So there, there's an interesting question here, and I'm, I'm curious about both your thoughts on it. It's, um, thank you so much. I was wondering how children are involved in the protests, and this is from the, uh, question, the person's daughter. Yeah, my children are at um, all of the actions that they want to be at, and if they don't want to go, then many times I don't go. Um, and, you know, it just, it, when we talked about, you know, this being a, a generational effort and intergenerational effort that there's, um, absolutely a place for, for the young ones to be able to express themselves. Um, there's a lot of, um, different art projects that are involved, uh, the youth camp that was held last summer was um, designed for, you know, for the youth to be able to learn um, storytelling through the media, for them to be able to go rafting, for them to just learn every aspect um, around, around the river and, and to camp there and have that direct experience of how, um, how this affects them and their families. And, and, you know, this is a multi-generational struggle. Uh, Morning Star touched on it and so did Brittany. And by that, and in my presentation, I shared, you know, this is a 528 year struggle, but, it, but deeper than that, um, and we use the term protesters a lot. Um, it's not a play on words when we say, this is about protecting. This is about protecting indigenous peoples, homelands and territories. Uh, we raised our daughter um, in the movement. One of our grandsons was at his first uh, action when he was uh, not even two years old. Uh, the kinds of things that Morningstar is also re referencing is, is framed within um, cultural relationship, within right relation to lands, to our homelands, to our waters, to our practices, to our cultural uh, perspectives, to our unique and distinct world views. That is a bond that um, helps inform what the actions are. Pretty much with all indigenous 
people's um, actions and, and demonstrations and manifestations all over the world, um, they're multi-generational. You know, sometimes people will say, well, how come, you know, where are the women or where are the men or where are the elders or the children? You look at indigenous people's movements, we're all there. We're all there. And we're all there multiple generations. Um, and as Brittany was sharing, that's not easy. That's not easy. Let's frame it in 528 years. That's not easy. And some people might even want to reject that. But it's always about land and water. And we're still at land back. We're still at Aquaside. So um, hopefully we'll see, the three of us, we'll see the kind of change we've committed our lives to see. But we also are very aware that it's a multi-generational work. That means we have to train our young people in a diversity of tactics and a multiplicity of actions in order to achieve um, what we're looking what we're looking to, to reachieve, to reestablish, right? Not only decolonization, but re-indigenization of our lands and our territories and our waters. And it's part of a larger continuum. Uh, one protest is not the movement, whether children there or not. It's what's happened over the great swath of landscape and waterways all these many generations. Yeah, I, I, um, I can only really, I guess, I, I keep saying I agree. I agree with everything you both are saying. Um, it's really nice uh, to be able to have this conversation. Um, I mean, I started getting interested in um, all of this. I mean, I grew up around my grandfather who, is a, um, who just passed away actually, but um, who was a member of the tribe and going up to Hoopa and spending summers with him really influenced my way of thinking about being a native person, a Hoopa person, and really um, being invested in education and um, knowing more about my tribe. Like he really took me under my his wing and just everything, any questions I had, he would answer them, even if they were annoying to him, like he did all of that for me. Um, and that was the biggest influence that I had in my life on um, being a native person. Um, and so I got interested in a lot of this when I was 16, as I mentioned in um, my presentation when the fish die off happened. Um, and it's, this is just kind of reflection, I guess, but I, as we were organizing this whole thing, I was, we we're, we've been talking about youth panels. So we will have a youth panel um, in August, I believe, with some great youth active um, advocates who are working towards uh, water protection in uh, our areas and our lands. And I was like, oh, I'm not a youth anymore. Like I'm 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 now in the like adult generation. Um, I'm in my 30s, and I'm like, wow. I mean, this is something that my grandfather fought too for the rest of his whole life, like, you know, um, until he passed away at 90. And I wonder like, where am I gonna be at 90? Is this gonna be the same thing? Are people gonna wheelchair me out at these um, events, at these advocacy movements? And it is a really multi-generational thing and a community thing and knowing each other and being there. Um, but, you know, personally, I would I would love to be with my community in a way that, and we are, but like in a way where we're not, you know, continuously fighting against something that has been so, taken so much from us already. Um, and, you know, we, we laugh and we enjoy each other and we're around each other, but um, I guess I would like for that to be the norm more than like having to do I mean, doing these, um, this advocacy. And it's something that has to be done. Like, I, I cannot imagine not being involved in some way. And I know that many youth and elders can't imagine that either. Um, but again, the emotional weight of doing that is I think very uh, real in our communities, so. So we've had a, quite a few questions. Um, so here's one. What do you see environmental justice organizing going over the next few years? So I guess, how do we see the environmental justice movement going? 
as we continue this struggle. I can start with a little bit. Uh, if we're gonna couch that within the indigenous people's environmental justice movement, um, it, I gotta say it again. It's land back and it's about water. That's it. It's, it's about the return of indigenous people's homelands and territories and the deoccupation of our homelands. And um, that's what it's about. There are places along the way, those signposts where we are protecting specific things. We're responding to a particular attack, but the underpinning is the return. That's what decolonization is. It's not um, a cute little term we can put on the front of a sentence like a hipster headdress and make it so, right? Decolonization is about returning the land into the stewardship, into the care of those who have been born of and are responsible for that place. And the languages that come from there, the waters that erupt from there, and um, the songs and the ceremonies that are grounded only there. And that is what it is about. If the um, more mainstream, a broader indigenous, uh, excuse me, um, environmental justice movement understands that and doesn't center white supremacy within its work, which it unfortunately so often does. And then Indians are called in like later um, as showstoppers or door openers. If it really is committed to protecting and honoring um, what the land and the earth of this area on this continent is about, or really in any area, it's to center indigenous peoples as core of any environmental justice movement to center the needs of indigenous peoples, the perspectives, the practices, and, and even the style with which we organize. And that would be um, really mobilizing. It could really create some change that has not yet been seen. The, the mainstream environmental movement is not always willing to do that. But I will put it here as a challenge to undo the thinking where um, white supremacy is the core of the environmental justice movement. It has been. We can't lie to ourselves that it has been anything else than that. To undo that and say, okay, what is this about? This is about protecting the water and defending the land. Who does that best? Who has those relationships? Indigenous peoples. Center indigenous peoples, perspectives, histories, and goals. And we will protect the land and we'll protect the water. I, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, I see a lot of the mainstream EJ movements. Um, again, it's, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of erasure of, um, of what the indigenous movements have contributed um, to it and, and really what the foundation of environmental justice is. Um, you know, it has been um, taken over in, in that sense and co-opted. And so, you know, when we're talking about, I see a lot of, you know, creating, creating the new and it's not necessarily creating the new, um, what, what we're talking about essentially is healing, is healing of ourselves individually, of healing our communities collectively, of healing our land, of healing um, our water back to where it's not toxic anymore. Um, and so through that, there, there has to be that redistribution of power. There has to be a redistribution of, um, of wealth and just acknowledging, you know, that for indigenous peoples, those, those were never our values. You know, those, we didn't place our, our value on this financial gain. And that really is where we are in such um, a scary place at this time, you know, with climate change, um, with what is happening um, through, through these so-called water wars within Northern California where water is being 
funnel through for big agriculture um, that, you know, that, that wasn't supposed to happen. And it has been in only these 80 to 100 years that this significant amount of damage has been created. And so being able to, to address that and have these honest conversations um, through, what that, through what that looks like through reparations, um, through distribution of, of wealth and, and power um, throughout our communities. Yeah, and, and something that I was thinking about um, and I have thought about in the mainstream environmental justice movement is, is the tendency to, um, for organizers, you know, well-intentioned um, as they are um, to do a land acknowledgement, which, which is important to center where you're at. Um, but not necessarily always include the tribes in that or include tribal members who might be um, able to speak on the environmental issues that are happening in their area. Or if they do that, that's, that's what they do. They do their prayer or their land acknowledgement. And I guess I would, I would like to see more um, of the breakdown of, the, of white supremacy within the movement as uh, Tia was saying, but also just a more, um, solidarity between you know indigenous peoples and um other black people of color um who are so impacted by by everything that's going on in the environmental realm um because it's all interconnected like i know we like to on the Klamath River, at least, we like to say that what happens on the Klamath happens to every other water system um, in the state and beyond. And I think whatever happens in an environmental space uh, to any community is happening to all of us too. Um, and I, I tend to see that these environmental, the environmental justice movements pop up in different areas, but there's not a lot of like bridging or interconnecting with each other. And, and I don't have like, I keep saying I don't have the answers to that, but it also like those of us who are working in this space to start thinking about ways of bridging and being in solidarity with each other um, across space and place. And I think you both do that work very well um, in your respective um, areas and positions and you know, globally trying to solve these, this crisis of environmental injustice, which at its roots is based in capitalism and colonialism and imperialism and all the isms that have contributed to our, um, you know, our, our place now in the world. So um, here's actually a question I, I would like to hear both Tia and Morningstar um, you reflect on. Um, how is COVID-19 impacting how states and federal government work with tribes and native communities? Or how are you, um, how are you um, in your respective roles organizing around the COVID-19 restrictions or, and what, and how are you bringing t people together through this new world of Zoom and, you know, all that? There, there's a lot of challenges with that. Um, people need to be able to have access to technology. People need to be able to um, have, have access to, to hotspots and Wi-Fi so that right there is a barrier. Um, through some of the water planning efforts, I know um, in, in March and April um, that the, the deadlines were still um, moving forward and there weren't extensions happening because the state of California through DWR, they considered this to be essential, um, essential planning um, that was taking place for, um, for tribes to be able to respond to. So if you don't have adequate technology and hardware, um, the equipment that's needed, if you don't know your way, 
around um, Zoom, I, I have an elder friend that I was on the phone with yesterday that was asking um, if I can walk them through Zoom because they know that they're missing out on a lot of meetings and just being able to connect um, with one another in, in this way virtually um, as we're able to now. But there are these barriers that are being, being set in place. And so we're seeing that through our children's, um, you know, those are educational barriers for our children. Those are barriers for tribal peoples to be able to respond within a timely manner um, on these dates set. Um, it, it is difficult not to be able to have these these face to face um, and you know in in person meetings that we are used to having. Um, I think that you know we're also seeing. It, I think it's also important um, in these conversations to speak to um, the number of of our relatives that are being impacted. Um, by COVID-19, um, you know, the number of indigenous children that are being kept in cages, um, the number of, of peoples that are um, across these false border walls um, and the, the colonial violence that is being imposed on, on sovereign lands and territories that we are not hearing about um, and the impact of, of COVID, um, that is, is affecting all of our communities in that way. Yeah, really appreciating what, what Morningstar is sharing because it's really challenging. It was challenging before. And now here we are in the situation where, you know, if we're talking about federal and, and state governments, it, you know, consultation is not consent. And, and indigenous peoples have a right to protect our lands and territories. Uh, we have a right of self-determination and we have the right of free prior informed consent before anything happens on our lands and territories. And to over, and that's already an issue. That's already a challenge to um, be able to respond to um, constant imminent threats from everybody, from whether it be government, whether it be, whether it be extractive industries, whether it be uh, some other kind of invasion or incursion. And, and so you add COVID onto it and it poses as all the, the points that Morningstar outlined so many additional challenges, as well as, you know, maybe the accelerating impacts and the accelerating targeting of indigenous people's lands and territories, um, because people are sheltering, indigenous communities all over the world are heavily impacted and, um, and it's tough, it's really tough, um, whether it be around access to, to digital capacity and, and these kinds of platforms, or even the ability to connect with each other. The people are also, I want to say this um, to anyone's listening out there and thinking, hey, that's great, we're going to make a move. Um, we are also very well organized. We're also very well, um, we're good collaborators with each other. We're well networked and we're very innovative. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. So Indigenous peoples continue to respond in new ways and in, and in old tried and true ways to um, protect our lands and territories and protect our, our peoples and our cultures and adapting and learning in new dynamic ways about how to do this at this time, because I think we're also aware COVID's not just a couple of months. We already know that. It's not even just like uh, four months. It may not only be six months. This might be with us for a really long time. And this time, um, which is also known as a time of prophecy among many people, may also be a very revealing time providing for us new ways to respond to protect our lands and territories and our waters. So I wanted to add that part because there's so many challenges. A lot of our people are sick with COVID. Um, a lot of our people are already experiencing, um, you know, already impacted with health issues, food systems issues, um, et cetera. And um, so there's just so many things happening. At the same time, there's a real movement around community gardening and returning to cornfields and returning to traditional foods, traditional medicines, and other kinds of ways that our peoples have used for hundreds of years to to nourish and sustain ourselves for this very thing we called life. This very thing that we call life for indigenous persons is protecting our lands and territories and waters. And I think we're gonna see some very interesting new developments in the indigenous people's movement that's formed um, out of our corn and out of our acorns and our salmon. 
and form from our places. Um, and we're gonna return to some um, diversity of tactics that work. So yeah, we're impacted, though we're not down and out yet. Yeah, I, I think that those are all very powerful points to make that what's happening with the pandemic right now has affected us in many, many ways beyond just doing the, um, you know, uh, interacting with people in spaces like this with our, our relatives be, being sick or um, the very, the impact of health um, of indigenous communities that um, are going through this, it's, it's real. And, and on top of this is the struggle to protect land and life. Um, and then also the federal government's attacks on indigenous sovereignty and um, that are happening through the court system or through uh, state mandated um, blockages or any of that, like all of the things that we already have to deal with are compounded by this um, horrific pandemic. Um, so thank you both for your very thoughtful answers. Uh, we have we have time for one qu more question, I think. Um, we actually got, got quite a few. And um, so given the emotional toll, what does it take to rejuvenate and keep going with this powerful work? You have to stay mindful this is a marathon. This is a marathon, this is not a sprint. Every once in a while, hit the wall, refuel, and run some more. Or it's a run walk, right? Um, there is an emotional toll, there's a spiritual toll, there's, there's a, a multiplicity of impacts on say, a one person, or even on a family. I mean, I think when we say mindful, about um, we say focused on what our goals are and also recognizing that it's not about us personally we happen to be carrying this forward for a few steps uh, picking it up from those that were ahead of us thousands and thousands of those that have been ahead of us and the ones that are coming it it's a much more of an empowerment matrix than it is a a um depleted one it doesn't mean we don't get tired. It doesn't mean that we may not even get frustrated or sad, overwhelmed for a moment. But I've been at this for a long time, over three decades. And um, remember when I was the youth back at one time. And, uh, and I think that is a, an important perspective that this is a long term thing. And a momentary uh, tiredness or a momentary frustration or even a momentary overwhelm, a momentary loss is really um, something small on the whole face of what the movement is moving toward, what we're doing, what our role is at any given moment to realize that we're carrying something forward can be, um, can help us. It's a, it's a distribution of energy, no single person is going to make the difference, we all individually and collectively will make that difference. I agree. I think that there's, you know, just even reflecting back on, on these last few months and um, the lessons in that, you know, the lessons in, in surviving pandemics as indigenous peoples in surviving through these many waves of, of smallpox and the way that our food systems were poisoned and the way that there are still these back barriers to, um, to our, the, the basics of, of, of accessing our traditional foods. Um, you know, and I, and I don't say that in, in a flippant way, but when I start just reflecting on that and having, you know, a difficult time um, navigating, you know, what be a lot of the, the politics and whatnot is that our, our people were, our people are warriors 
um, we are raising generations of warriors and our peoples survived so much that our ancestors, um, you know, I think about how my great grandmother uh, was force marched from Pitt River to, to Round Valley and was able to make her way back. And so the hardships that they faced was, was their survival, their survival for us. Um, and so just allowing those prayers to carry you forward, um, taking that time to go, I think that's something that I've learned, like taking that time to go to the river and, um, you know, just be able to give, um, give that heaviness that you carry at times, um, taking that to the water and, and having that, that replenishment time. This is a time after, um, you know, 30 days of, of just some really heavy lifting. Um, of, you know, we need that time of, of regeneration. We need that time to just kind of reflect on all of that um, and be able to, to be ready again for what's ahead of us. You know, water is our first medicine, right? Water is our first medicine. And um, I think about a lot of that too, because really I think our spiritual foundations and our, our ceremonial actions really help us help us move forward, inform every one of those steps. Yeah, I think taking the time to for self care and health and community care and health is really important, especially at this moment. Um, you know, I think it's with all the things that are happening right now. Um, and especially today being the day before you know, Independence Day, American Independence Day, and what that means to indigenous people who have are occupied people on occupied land. Um, I mean, I, I guess I had never thought about myself in that way until like years ago when I was like, oh yeah, that's that's what's ha that's what's happened to us. Um, and like reflecting with that and like carrying this trauma within your your bones and your body and like just ha having that and and feeling it like every day all the time it's like there's not i've mentioned this before but there's not a time that i turn that off i guess um like i don't leave work and then lay down and say okay i cannot think about this anymore but that being said, like I find so much reju rejuvenation in my friends and like looking up to indigenous women, Tia and Morningstar have long been heroes of mine um, and seeing the work that they do and the care that they put into the community has been really um, heartening for me. And like um, also looking at youth and elders who continue to, to, do, to fight and to fight for justice and realize that it's okay to be tired and it's okay to take time for yourself but that you know this is something that is a responsibility to have and to do and and it's a multi-generational intergenerational responsibility um that I think really brings us together as a community and I'm I'm always I feel fortunate to be a part of that um as hard as it is um so I, I just want to say I appreciate you both and I appreciate the time that you've taken to come and speak to um, us here for this series um, and to talk more about environmental injustice and the, the impacts it has on Indigenous people throughout many different spaces, um, not just the environment, but through our health and our well-being too. Um, so thank you both for joining today. And so it is 1.31. We didn't get to answer all the questions. So if you have any um, further questions, um, feel free to reach out to us at Save California Salmon. This um, web video, this video will be posted on the Save California Salmon website. We'll also be providing resources uh, related to this video. Um, I'd also like to thank Carrie Tully and Stephen Cheney for helping us with the, um, the background, the computer stuff. Uh, we really appreciate the efforts that you put into this and um, thank you all and have a good rest of your day and weekend. Thank you.
Thank you so much.